With advances in prenatal diagnosis technology, expectant parents now receive more information about their unborn child than ever before. When that information includes a diagnosis that will shorten the baby's life, the journey to parenthood can take an unexpected turn. Perinatal hospice care is a unique care pathway which accompanies parents on this journey as they prepare to welcome into the world a child who has a life-limiting condition. It is a holistic model of care which provides medical and nursing attention, psychological and emotional support, as well as practical guidance for families whose baby is likely to pass away soon after birth. Sometimes referred to as comfort care or neonatal palliative care, perinatal hospice care is a crucial service that guides a family through pregnancy, birth and the postnatal period to ensure that they, together with their new baby, have a comfortable, happy and rewarding experience, even under these most difficult of circumstances. Dr. Anna Martine Ansel, a neonatologist from Spain, helps to deliver perinatal hospice care from her hospital in Barcelona. Um, so I would say that perinatal hospice care is a kind of comprehensive care, attend, medical attention, to those patients that uh, have been found to have illnesses before being born that will uh, make them die probably before being born, during the birth or even after, like say, some minutes, hours, days or months. And it is a care also for their families because they are really a unit. There are many different professionals involved, obstetricians, different uh, specialists, might be a cardiologist or neurologist or surgeons, the midwives. There's a spiritual care, psychological care, so many, many different professionals involved. Across the ocean in New York City, Dr. Elvira Paravicini established and together with her team of specialists now runs a unit that is dedicated to providing a range of services to families who are carrying to term a baby with a life-limiting condition. Yeah, I would say perinatal hospice care means uh, a care who starts during pregnancy and go through the delivery. So uh, perinatal hospice and neonatal comfort care are basically um, medical and nursing uh, support for babies with life-limiting condition, babies that are expected to have a very, very short life. And uh, he's something that starts during pregnancy, continues through the delivery and then beyond. And also, even after the baby dies, continues supporting the family to help them going through the grieving process. In our hospital, we have a very busy prenatal service. Many women with high-risk pregnancy are coming here. And therefore, um, we encounter mothers, families, um, carrying babies with very um, severe diseases, including life-limiting conditions. So, uh, as I w was working here um, as a neonatologist, you know, counseling uh, uh, women and families during the pregnancy, I realized that uh, nothing was really in place for those babies with life-limiting condition once they were born. Their life uh, is there, whether it's seven minutes, seven hours, or seven days, or seven weeks. And so I felt uh, uh, the need to set up a program to specifically take care of them and specifically um, address the needs of these babies and their families. Frances McCarthy, a nurse with over 30 years' experience, is now dedicated full-time to coordinating the Comfort Care Unit at New York Presbyterian Hospital. There's not one person or one discipline that can cover everything that needs to be done in comfort care. And so we need a medical director, which we have. We need nurses, we need um, child life specialists, social workers, psychologists. We need the obstetrical side as well, particularly for our perinatal uh, cases. The idea here though for us is that we are really focused on the comfort of our babies. So even though their lives are going to be short, we want them to be as happy and as fulfilled as, as it can be for them under the circumstances of, of their condition. But really it's, it's end of life care and the focus is on life. Each child is, is unique, and so we modulate uh, our care according to how the child 
goes. We love to say to the parents in our program that we always follow the baby. The baby will tell us how long, how long we live. And in fact, our cover care program is based on um, giving basic support to the little baby, to the person, um, to guarantee the natural life. Also be reassured that they're not gonna be alone. You know, this is also very, very important. We um, offer our help uh, a support uh, also to go through the pregnancy, the delivery, and then, you know, the, the birth of the baby in the postnatal period, helping holding that baby uh, with all the problems and also addressing the problems. They are probably worried how this baby is going to eat. How can we even hold the baby if the baby has many malformations? So we, we are there to say we are here with you and we'll make it together. Well, the facilities we offer are not much different from those that we offer to every pregnant woman here in the hospital. I mean, the places where we visit them are exactly the same, although we try to give them the visit at a very early hour in the morning so that they do not have to be in the queue, let's say, and wait with other women who maybe expect babies who are not that sick, or they might give birth in the very same uh, facilities than other women, but the attention they would receive will be different. They do not need special technologies or whatever, but just that professionals are aware of the situation. Even also in the postpartum period, they will come to rooms like this one, which are the very same that for healthy kids. But the same, the nurses, the doctors will know that this baby is in this situation and will uh, treat them in a very special care. So all of our moms will deliver privately. In our labor and delivery rooms, there are also recovery rooms. So the mom would come in, she would labor there, she would deliver there, and she would recover there. After several hours, then she would go to a postpartum unit room, also uh, a single bedded room. So there's a lot of privacy, and particularly for our babies, they always have a single room. So our hospital has recognized that this is a very delicate time for these families, and they need privacy. So we have a very open visiting policy, so it's really up to the parents. They let us know who they want to visit, and we do the crowd control. So I talk to the nurses up in the labor and delivery room, and I say, you know, this is what this family has expressed that they want. These are where the visitors are. I will contact the visitors after the baby's delivered, if that's the way the family wants it. Or, um, no, they want the, the family to be in the, the delivery at the time of delivery. It will vary from family to family. Myself and Dr. Paravicini will be in the room, so we physically have our hands on these babies, and we will bring the babies directly to, to mom. I think. One of the most important things that we try to do is have a mom's face to her baby's face immediately after birth. And there is nothing like seeing this warm, wet face against a mother's face. They, they are absolutely, it, it, it's angelic. And they are so happy, they're crying, but they know that their baby, it, it, it's their baby. The first and basic, basic need of parents is to be able to experience parenthood, motherhood and fatherhood. And uh, when you gave uh, a news like this, that your baby is going to have a very short life, this is kind of being destroyed. Okay. And so I think the very first thing we need to address and we attempt to address with our teamwork is to sustain and reassure them that their parenthood is going to happen. We work to make this happen, to allow them to be fathers and mothers. And so all the services, which can be different from family to family, um, uh, are meant to use in this sense. Uh, as I mentioned before, some um, parents are even afraid to think about to hold their babies, to see them. Um, because they don't look normal. And it's nothing to do with loving the baby or not. Actually, it's, it's a sign of, it's a cry for helping to, um, it's a cry for loving them. The fact that you are afraid to hold them because they're so different, no? And so um, I think our role as a professional is also helping them going through this step to fulfill their parenthood. I think the families need an acknowledgement of their sadness, of the grief, of the loss of this dream that they've had. 
a dream for what this baby's life might have been, for their hopes for their child, for their hopes to be parents. We have to acknowledge that. But we also then have to acknowledge that their child has a lot of living to do before their child will die. And so we don't concentrate on the death as much as we concentrate on making memories and making um, this time important for as long as it is. And sometimes that time will only be while a mom's pregnant. And we discuss that. We talk about what is it like to be pregnant with a baby who's not expected to live long. At every meeting, the first time we meet a family, we say congratulations because their child has meaning to them. This baby, this pregnancy is important to them. And so we need to um, recognize that and, and let them know that we recognize it. Part of what families want is to believe that their child's life had meaning for the world. Language and communication is something that can really influence how a family views and understands their child's condition and prognosis. This is, of course, a sensitive time of heightened emotion, and information needs to be factual and correct, but always delivered in a compassionate and delicate way. Words mean so much to these parents, and they can have a profound effect on them, as was the case for Sarah and Ben, parents to baby Hannah. My name is Sarah Spolstra, and this is my husband, Ben. Um, and we had our first daughter, our first child, in June of this year. Um, and she was diagnosed with anencephaly when we were about 14 weeks pregnant. I remember it sticking totally in my mind when you we were at the ultrasound um, where we got the diagnosis. I remember her, I just, all I remember, like everything kind of, once you hear like bad news, your, your brain just kind of like shuts off and you don't even hear what the doctor's saying. But I just remember hearing one word and that word was lethal. Yeah. And I lost it. And like that word just like burns into my memory. We just needed someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. We needed someone who was um, compassionate, compassionate, but yet knowledgeable, right. professional, but that we could just simply talk to and ask questions with. Mm -hmm. I think that was probably what was most refreshing about when we sat in this very room mm -hmm. talking to Dr. Paravicini for the first time was she focused on what Hannah's life was going to be like. You know, like we already knew what the end was going to be, mm -hmm. but um, she was more concerned with. Um, the short time that Hannah was with us. What is her life going to be like? Is she going to be comfortable? Um, what kind of memories do you want to make with her? Um, and even just something as simple as referring to her as our baby, our yeah, daughter, yeah, Hannah by name. Yeah. Like a lot of the other doctors, like, you know, once they once they know that your baby's not going to live, it's like right. not a baby anymore to right, them. Right. The language is very, very, very important. Um, a, a parent who is expecting a baby with a life-limiting condition is is destroyed by the news and is afraid to think about that the baby with such a condition will be born. And so um, it's very important for us as a professional to um, support the parents in welcoming this baby. But the situation here is so hard that it's almost, almost I want to say, impossible for them to embrace that baby at that moment. It's very, very difficult. And so the language we use um, as we enter a relationship with them to counsel them is always um, asking, is a baby boy, is a baby girl? Did you give a name already? Uh, we, um, we explain about other stories with other babies with similar condition. We want to communicate that uh, we do care for that baby. That's our mission. We are uh, in medicine in order to help a patient. So our goal is there to help them, but even before them, to help this baby to get the best possible from his or her life. So I feel that language is very important and also expresses what the professional thinks. So uh, it is not just by the words, but also by how you look at the person, how you stay in front of them, uh, but also words, uh, they remember these words for the rest of their life. And like saying little, for instance, eh, or um, eh, not viable, that's, eh, that's not really true. It is one of the things I've heard most times coming from people coming from other places, that they say, finally, there's someone who cares for my baby and they perceive very clearly the difference. Uh, the use of terms like incompatible with life or lethal, I, I, I think they are wrong, they are false. 
because uh, the, this baby is going to be born and this baby is going to live. Now it's going to be living for a short time, but th there is a life there. And so um, those expressions, they don't reflect the reality. Secondly, um, they are very harsh towards the parents. You know, when you communicate to parents during pregnancy, you have to be respectful of the fact that this is their baby. They love them. And so use an expression like lethal incompatible with life is also very, um, yeah, very harsh on them and taking away the hope of the fact that they, they will see their baby alive maybe for a few minutes. Um, but I, I think the, the first reason is really scientific. There is life there, there is a baby who's growing, a baby who's going to be born, a baby who's going to breathe for a short period of time. So, I think life-limiting condition is the best definition. When a baby is diagnosed as having a life-limiting condition, nobody can say for certain how long the life of that child will be. In fact, as medical technology advances, new therapies and treatments mean babies with these conditions are living longer and therefore changing how we care for them. Dr. Paula Kelly is a clinical nurse specialist in paediatric palliative care at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London and has experience in caring for babies whose prognosis or length of life is uncertain. The other thing I would say about prognosis is, in, in my um, experience, is it's evolving and it's changing. So when I started working as a children's nurse, which is quite a long time ago, um, for example, um, uh, babies who were born with spinal muscular atrophy, type 1, did not survive, I would say, in my experience, beyond probably nine months. They certainly didn't get to a year. Whereas we now have children on our caseload who have had their third birthday. And so I think that ev evolving of um, prognosis, so spinal muscular atrophy type 1 is still a, it's a life limiting condition, but actually um, the length of time of survival has um, evolved considerably. It's impossible to say. Most of the babies with severe, severe anomalies, they maybe live within the life as short as 24 hours, like within, they will die the day they're born, more or less. But it's so difficult. We had cases of babies with severe, severe uh, malformation of the brain who go on and live for maybe weeks. It's very difficult to predict. There is an average, is what you read from the medical report, and that's what we communicate to the parents. And so I always say we never know for the good or for the bad. And so again, I give this proposal, let's follow the baby and see how his life is going to develop. So sometimes we talk about the term parallel planning because one of the things that's I think particularly prevalent in neonatal palliative care is this sense of uncertainty. So we expect certain conditions to be fatal um, but sometimes they're not or they are fatal but the time at which they will be fatal is uncertain. And so we make one plan for a baby being born alive and not surviving for very long. And then we make another plan for if that baby survives longer. Addressing any mental health needs of the family before, during and after birth is a critical component of perinatal hospice care. While it is true that most parents won't need any professional psychological support, having access to a perinatal psychologist can be very helpful in accompanying a family along this journey. Rochelle Steinwurzel is a perinatal psychologist who counsels families who are expecting a baby with a life-limiting condition. Every parent loves their baby, and every parent wants their baby to live a long and healthy life. And coming to terms with the fact that that's not part of the plan for this baby um, is, is one of the most challenging aspects of this experience because they're going to go back and forth. Even long after the baby has died, they go back and forth. I think that if you can have a psychologist who's staffed and the part of the role is to provide ongoing bereavement and if you're also working with a more local population, I think that's certainly something that a psychologist along with um, 
Another team member may be maybe a very valuable role. We are meant to carry healthy babies, to deliver healthy babies, and therefore um, the help of people who know what does it mean, you know, grieving, facing very stressful situation, um, is is very important just to be helped. Um, you know, almost no one of the mothers uh, that we meet or the families that we meet went through the same thing in the past, thank God. But, um, and so they, they really need the help, professional help, to face the situation. We are not talking about necessarily people with, you know, depressive syndrome or anything like this, but just going through the fact that you're carrying a baby who's going to die soon put you in a position that you don't know how to manage that. And so this is very, very important. We want to create a sense of families being held by every person that they encounter, and that's a psychological holding. But it's really, can we create a net? And the doctors are incredibly important to that. These are the doctors and nurses are the people who are parents' only hope. Parents hope that's their job. We had, and so comfort care crosses a, an interesting space where we're saying what you're hoping for, which for every parent is a long, healthy life, we have to shift your hope to something different. And so how the team, how the doctors and the medical staff and, and all of us help to translate and hold their ambivalence, their hope, their fear, their relief sometimes. You know, there's so many mixed emotions that come through in in, in, in your baby not not surviving, You're, but how will your baby live in the time that he or she can survive? A real concern of parents who receive a life-limiting diagnosis for their baby is will their child suffer after birth and will they be in any pain or distress at the time they pass? Perinatal hospice and neonatal palliative care helps to alleviate these concerns for parents. This is a big question also during our counseling in pregnancy. Parents are very, very worried about baby suffering. So that's what we say to the parents, that is our experience. I always say to the parents, who is going to suffer is you. Because, uh, you know, you are aware that your baby is going to have a short life. And so that's the source of suffering. Babies with even very, very, very severe malformation like missing kidneys, uh, having uh, missing the brain, or other severe malformation, per se, they don't tend to suffer necessarily. Suffering for a newborn, it will be undergo surgery, um, having someone placing IVs, undergo uh, procedures. But this even terrible, terrible disease, they don't really make a baby suffer per se. Uh, it can be some discomfort sometimes because um, maybe baby had difficulty breathing. In that case, we can administer oxygen, suction. Uh, we can have plenty of painkillers um, given uh, orally or intranasally. They have very good effect, but it's very, very rare that we need to administer anything. Babies tend to die almost sleeping away. The breathing becomes uh, slower and slower and slower, and the heart rate will do the same. Um, till the point that parents are holding the baby and they, they call us uh, to, to listen to the chest of the baby because they don't even appreciate if the baby's still there or not, in a sense. And I think that's one of the kind of, um, the, the kind of largest worries um, for parents is that their um, uh, baby might be in, in pain or actually that they might not be in pain but they might be distressed and frightened about, you know, kind of, and I think that's where we have a growing body of um, experience and um, knowledge about managing um, symptoms of pain and distress, a lot of which we have learned from neonatal services. So I certainly think that idea of um, comfort and what we've learned about um, skin to skin contact um, um, and how important that is and can have um, quite significant physiological effects on babies who are very, very um, unwell. So we're learning all the time about how we can manage pain effectively um, by using 
analgesics that reduce um, and treat pain, but at the same time give the balance so that um, uh, where possible babies can still be active and feed and um, responsive um, to um, their parents and, and people who are caring for them. It is almost always very peaceful, this passing of, of the babies. Even in the cases they've got uh, problems that might uh, bring uh, respiratory distress, but at this moment we've got medication so that, so that babies are comfortable. But uh, most of them like just go very slowly, like do not breathe, the heartbeat goes lower, they move very little and like they got kind of slept uh, on, on their moms. That's, that happens many, many times. The principles of perinatal hospice care can be summed up by the satisfaction of basic needs of the baby. The baby needs to be welcomed, needs to be kept warm, needs to be free of any discomfort and also needs not to be hungry or thirsty. With that in mind, where possible, feeding is central to the delivery of this model of care and can be a positive experience for the family. They work really hard and they are very creative. Uh, some of these babies are born with severe problems, even not, not just of the GI tract, but even of their mouth. And so um, since feeding is such a pleasure for a little baby, they found a way to feed pleasantly also a baby with oral problems, which is very reassuring because, um, you know, for parents, feeding is very important as well as is important for the baby to be comfortable. And so the possibility to feed the baby is, uh, is a fundamental point. A mother, you know, or a father, being able to hold the baby and have that time, even if it's just providing, like we said, non-nutritive, so something that maybe is just small taste trials and not necessarily, you know, taking one or two, three ounces, but giving parents that time to hold and to feed is a very normal thing. When a baby is, is born without these conditions, one of the first things the parents can engage in is feeding. And so even if the window of time for that baby is, is short, making sure the parents can do a very normal behavior that can also potentially provide comfort to the baby. And so giving parents the opportunity to be engaged in the care is, is really important. We. Um really try to help parents overcome the anxiety of being the one to do the wrong thing by, by being also completely present in that moment to help them every step along the way. Just the effort that, and the attempt to, to provide that activity for the, the baby is always a memorable experience for the families and getting over their own fear of taking that leap to try it is usually the hardest part and once they've done it always really grateful and very happy that they've done it, even if it means the baby passes away soon thereafter. I once took care of a baby um, who actually, she was this tiny, tiny little thing. And she, after about an hour after she was born, was, you know, rooting like crazy. And we put her on the mother's breast and this baby latched on like she'd been doing it forever. And I cannot tell you how joyful this mother was that Look at her, look at her, she, she's taking my breast, look at this. They were thrilled to death. And she passed, you know, maybe 12 or 14 hours later, but they had that moment. And if she had not been born, they never would have seen that. Within perinatal hospice care, a huge emphasis is put on making memories as a way to embrace the pregnancy and to remember these babies after they have passed away. Families admit that it is these memories that help them through some of their most difficult times. Mary Ann Verzosa is a child life specialist who creates lasting memories for a family of the life of their child. So, um, in the comfort care program, and here in the NICU with our um, end of life cases, uh, where it's 
time is this is very sensitive we my role as a child life specialist is to try to create as many positive and beautiful memories for the family um, even though it's a limited time there's so much that can be done and um, you know capturing pictures of a parent just doing like very basic parenting things like kissing their baby and holding their baby um, reading a book to their to their baby um, singing to them um, creating you know memories from whether it's printing out those pictures and creating a video for the for the um, family or whether it's memory making and doing handprints and footprints. Memory making is a huge part of what we do. Certainly one of the great advantages of the time we live in is cell phones. So every family has a cell phone. And most families have nice cameras, which is great. But we also do footprints and we do um, these beautiful molds of feet and hands that are, are done by our child life specialist. And they are three dimensional. So families can actually you know, run their fingers over the, the baby, the bottom of their baby's feet or hands. And they're very detailed so they can see the creases, they can see fingernails. It, they're really lovely. And there's something a little bit more than just a two dimensional uh, footprint. So we encourage that kind of thing. Even during pregnancy, I encourage mothers to journal, to take pictures of themselves, to you know go to do things that they might have done with their baby, had their baby been able to live a long time, and take pictures of those things as well. Anything that has meaning for them that will add to, to their um, memories of this child. I think it's important for, you know, whether you live zero days, whether you live 90 days to make lasting memories, um, especially for infants, you know, they, the memories they have are so limited. So these concrete, tangible things can, you know, provide something that families can have um, that they can reach to. Sometimes they don't have actual pictures and they don't have a lot of memories like you know taking their baby to a park or you know being at home with their baby but they'll have you know just a simple handprint of their of their infant that they can um, always like look to and because the concreteness of actually putting of creating something of putting their actual prints and the lines on their fingers on an actual item like a canvas or paper or a plaster you know it recognizes that this person existed in this life it honors their existence in this family and um helps that family remember that there there was this family member that they love so much that did not you know, stay with them for a long time, but they existed, and it's just honoring them as a, you know, as a family member. Perinatal hospice care is not limited to the medical and healthcare staff within the hospital setting. Volunteer-run support organisations are a huge source of comfort and practical help to these families, and are often the first point of contact for parents after receiving a life-limiting diagnosis for their child. One such organisation is Felicon which means butterfly in the Irish language and is based in Ireland. Hi, my name is Linda Walsh and th over three years ago we lost our little girl Quiva. It was around that time we heard about the charity called Failcom. Up until then we never knew about it. Uh, I suppose the first time I found out about them was when uh, we heard that Quiva wasn't going to survive, that she was given a life-limiting condition. Uh, Failcom supply memory boxes throughout the country nationwide to all maternity hospitals. They also supply the memory boxes to children hospitals. I've heard from a number of couples after receiving the memory box, how hearing such devastating news, how the memory box had helped them to spire off ideas, to go and make memories within that short space of time. And without the memory box, they wouldn't have had that instinct to do that. The cuddle cots were introduced by Failcom a number of years ago and they're like that too, they're in every maternity hospital in the country. And what it is, it allows the, uh, the family the opportunity to have the child with them at all times. It also provides them the opportunity to bring their baby home for one sleepover, two sleepovers, depending on the baby. Some people have even taken them, their babies home for three to four sleepovers. Failacom supply the cuddle cot and the memory boxes nationwide uh, free. They're, it's a free service they provide, but they also provide the service of counselling as well and they run a number of workshops like children workshops for siblings, they run card making workshops for parents, they run uh, summer service, winter service, spring service 
And to be honest, the services are just so fantastic. Again, it gives the opportunity for parents to come together, acknowledge, honour and celebrate their children's life. And it really is a celebration. Even though we were told, and I knew that Quiva was going to pass, I urged to meet somebody else in the same situation. I craved to find someone else who's walked the journey that I walked, who knew that their baby was going to die and were still carrying their baby and their baby kicking and they were lonely, they were lonely times. But since then, thankfully it's come a long way that the voluntary groups have got that support there. And I've heard so many parents say, after hearing that news and walking out of the hospital and not knowing what to do, only for the voluntary group were there, that when they picked up the phone and they've walked that journey with them until such time as their baby has arrived and has gone from this world. I believe the voluntary groups, groups like Failcom, have a huge role to play with perinatal hospice. The main thing with Failcom and other groups similar, they are brave parents. We can read what we can read and we can sympathise and I would be very one of them very people that would say I'm really sorry for your loss. Until you go through the loss and walk in them shoes, you don't know the, the level of pain that I can get to. You don't know how your mind can react from one minute to the next and having voluntary groups on board supporting the perinatal hospital is huge. John Short is a photographer with Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep, an international volunteer organisation which offers the gift of remembrance photography. This service is offered free of charge to parents whose child is going to die soon. He and his colleagues selflessly offer their services in order to help families through the healing and bereavement process by providing them with beautiful professional photos of their child and his or her family. I know now that uh, what we give to the parents, uh, that they have something physical. Like after the, the child is, is gone and the, the funeral's over, that they can look back and they have those memories. And if, you know, there's, there's, there are times when the child is still alive and uh, they have a picture there of their baby, their eyes open or it's, it's hand holding their fingers. Uh, you know, for them, they have that physical evidence. It's something that they have and they cherish, and it's it's what gets them by, and it's what's made them, what's made the the baby real. You know, and it, I suppose if we can do that, then we can, out of all the, the sorrow, give them something that they uh, that they have to hold on to and to cherish. As, you know, as a photographer, I think if I, I could put the camera down tomorrow and I'd feel I, I achieved something I'd never have to I'd never have to pick up a camera again I think you know what I've actually done something good and you know I'll just keep on doing it and trying to help as many families as I can As we have heard it's impossible for us to know how long these babies with life limiting conditions will live and some in fact live long enough to leave the hospital and be at home with their families but that's not to say the care stops there because perinatal hospice care extends beyond the hospital and into the baby's home. This gives parents a wonderful opportunity to experience family life at home with their child for however long his or her life may be. Dr Sergio Navarro is a neonatal palliative care specialist who coordinates a home hospice team for babies with life-limiting conditions who live long enough to leave the hospital and be cared for at home. We know uh, that, that some babies will die in a few minutes or hours but sometimes it will be days, maybe weeks. Then we, we try to follow them and to, to, to treat them at home. Once they go home, no, they need to be empowered. No? Empowered for, for all the things that can happen be, before the baby dies or, or while he's dying. No? It's a family that have never been at home with the baby. It's the first time. It's a, a very, very difficult uh, uh, moment. So they have to, to know, to give them the tools, no, for uh, that they will be able to, to control all the symptoms, all the problems that appears in this end of life, no, this last day's uh, situation. Of course, again, it depends on the pathology. There are babies that survive more than a few days, even more than weeks, some of them even for months. And in those cases, of course, we give them the attention that need, which is not in hospital, but at home. And in that sense, it is very important to have home palliative care and services that are able to go 
to the home of these families and help them there. Yeah, of course, that's very important too. The vast majority of, of parents want to go home with their baby to have like a, a normal life or whatever is uh, allowed to happen. We have cases in which babies live for weeks or months and definitely there is the availability for uh, the family to be supported. To, to take home your baby is very dramatic but uh, is also the best solution to enjoy the baby, for the baby to enjoy his family. Never forget the baby also needs to have a beautiful experience. As we have seen, perinatal hospice care is a somewhat new and unique model of care. It is growing all the time as we learn more from these babies and their families. Unfortunately, many families who are preparing to welcome a baby with a life-limiting condition are left without the supports and the care they need to accompany them along this journey. Yeah, so the, we ran home and spent like the next week. Yeah, just researching, looking things up. Um, Quite frankly, most of the doctors were, weren't really sure about the specifics of it. They knew what the diagnosis was and they, knew, they could pick it out from the uh, ultrasound, but um, answering questions like, what is the life like for our baby? What is development like? What are the chances she'll be born alive? What does birth look like for a child with this diagnosis? Mm -hmm. They really knew none of it. You know, a lot of times because these, these babies are, um, their lives are ended before they're born, um, and that's the most common ending for this situation. They just, they don't really do the research and, and find out about specifics. So we were left with a lot of questions and not really sure where to go other than Wikipedia and whatever articles we could find online. And that was the other thing that was amazing in what they were doing here is that we were immediately partnered with mm -hmm. an OBGYN that we trusted and that like right off the bat we knew we were in good hands. They also provided like solid medical support. And, and, and so we felt safe and, we, and I felt mm -hmm. like Sarah was going to be taken care of um, just as if Hannah was going to be a healthy baby as well. They got us in within like a week or two. Yeah. And we sat here and we just felt like we could breathe a little bit for the first time yeah. since we found out the news. Like someone understands. Someone's here going to be here to walk us through this. We're not alone. Like that's how we felt. What we do it can be done anywhere because it doesn't require big, you know, devices or big environment. It just require um, attention to the comfort of the baby and support to the family. And I think that uh, um, many uh, families, many mothers would rather choose for this uh, um, program, let's say, uh, because as I said before, in the bottom of the heart of the parents, there is this desire to be mother and father, to be able to hold the baby who is alive even for a short period of time. And this is not my, just my opinion, but it comes from experience. We met families very, very often who said, I didn't know your program was around. I wish they told me before, because uh, um, no matter what, the, what you do, the life of this baby is short, but at least uh, if you follow the natural length of life of the baby, gives to the parents the possibility to be parents. And so um, several parents were so happy that they had the possibility to come and be enrolled in our program and, and welcome their babies like this. Mostly, uh, if we think that it is not very expensive, it does not require a kind of high technology, except for the diagnosis sometimes, but it just requires a very good education of professionals, a very good team, and just the, the knowledge of the value of these very little lives and the desire to, to be with them in the, in the way they need, which is very different. People are unaware that it exists. Getting the word out is important. And, and having people know that they have this option, that this is a reasonable consideration, it is a reasonable course of treatment, because it is a course of treatment. One of the my pet peeves is to hear people say, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna stop treatment. That is so not true. We are changing our goals. And there's a difference in that. Because again, we don't want people to feel as though we're abandoning them, that we're taking away care. We're giving them as much care as we can. It's just with a different focus for, for what we hope the end will be. This should be a standard of care and not something that, oh, I, does that exist? No, it should be a standard. Of course it exists. And it should exist, as I said, through the life uh, of any patient. 
And what about the staff? How is it caring for babies they know are going to die and caring for their families who are grieving the loss of their child? Can delivering perinatal hospice care be a rewarding and worthwhile experience for the healthcare professionals involved? Well, as I understand my, my job, uh, I wouldn't say uh, only to save lives. In fact, uh, I would say uh, I'm more to, to accompany uh, my patient in the moment. And many times, fortunately for a pediatrician, it, it is like saving lives. But when the time comes, which, it, which is uh, to accompany a baby to die, uh, I think that it is a unique uh, moment of the life of, of those babies and those families that I would say that they also help me to understand what is life about. Is it worth to live? What means 10 minutes, 10 days, 10 years or 100 years? It is also like that. So it does not make a lot of difference. Those, those little patients uh, teach us so much and how they, their families live those moments is so impressive that uh, I would say it is a privilege to be with them and to, to share with them these very hard moments but also these moments that are full of the joy of the life of those babies. One of the things that I find particularly uh, rewarding is you are meeting people at the worst of, of times but there's kind of a privilege in that um, that you are um, I think very privileged to be um, alongside them and what you see are people behaving in the most extraordinarily courageous way through those really difficult times and um, I wouldn't want to pass that up for anything um, the people that you get to know but also there's the opportunity to do something and our contribution might be very very small but we do have the opportunity to make a contribution to that and that is really very very um, rewarding. I know that some people can't imagine that there is joy in this kind of work they look at me and they they say oh my god that's your job <laughs> but uh, I am always amazed by the families. I'm, I'm looking at beautiful babies. I'm looking at many beautiful things happening. A family becoming a family. A woman and a man becoming parents. Although I think that happens long before a baby's actually born. And I say that to them. So it's very beautiful. It's very moving. It's still birth. It's still this miracle that happens. So um, birth into and then passing through this next door, there's still pretty amazing events in life. And um, that time in between can be really filled with just the most joy. Yeah. We, we actually were giving a conversation, I had a, a talk that we gave recently and one of the things I had said is that none of us knows how long our lifetime is, none of us. And so we're given the gift of this opportunity to help these families experience this <coughs> lifetime, whatever it is, and we feel really lucky. Yeah. I mean, you, you do get those successful cases, even even if you know it's maybe only for a moment or a few days you're helping the family, it, it's, it, they always seem very bittersweet because it's, it's kind of beautiful to be able to help a family that's in such a unique situation and to be there for that. And I think as a clinician, to have these experiences that are very unique, it's nothing, it's nothing that when I planned to do this profession, I ever thought I would encounter, but it's been such an amazing career opportunity but also just as a person to, to be in that moment with another person who's going through the emotions of this experience yeah. is it's pretty amazing and to be there when they say hello and to be there when they say goodbye it's, yeah we're very lucky there's no denying that being told your child has a life-limiting condition can be a very traumatic experience for any family the journey to birth that the family embarks on can sometimes be stressful and difficult. However, with the help of perinatal hospice, this can also be one of the most joyous, rewarding and positive experiences for the entire family. Carmen and her husband Danny were told their baby had trisomy 18, 
or Edwards syndrome, but with the help of good perinatal hospice services, went on to have a wonderfully joyous and life-changing experience as they prepared to welcome their son Pablo into the world. At the 13th week we, of pregnancy, I did a blood prenatal test and then we knew that Pablo has trisomy 18. So at first we got shocked, all our dreams, our plans broken. Uh, we started reading lots of articles about the pathology and we wonder how our little baby could have so terrible disease. At that time we stopped reading about the disease and start thinking about how we can love him more. One month before the date of birth, we talk about the doctor Colana Martinancel, a neonatology who has experience in um, perinatal hospice care, and she gives us excellent recommendations. Um, he lived for two days and a half, and he was a really sweet little child. Every day we remember him. He's always in our lives and not always in our hearts. We had an excellent parental hospice care and we had um, a, a very, very human care also. And even now uh, we are in touch with um, nurses and, and the doctor because we live together a marvelous experience. To other parents who are in a similar situation, I encourage them to go against the flow. Um, the situation, certainly, it's, it's hard. But as a mother, uh, as a father, to accept a child with a grave disease, uh, giving to him love, taking care of him, is a bit of sweet. I recommend to those parents to receive uh, hospice care um, and also there are a lot of associations where you can meet um, other parents who have similar situations and can give you their support and share their experiences. In the time that we can choose, we will choose Pablo again, not a healthy child because um, he's our child and he has given to us infinity things. When, when we deal with the birth of babies with life-limiting condition, obviously it's a very dramatic situation. However, um, the, at the moment of the birth of the baby and the few minutes or hours after that, um, we really see that moment as a celebration and uh, inexplicably uh, is there is a big moment of joy and beauty all the time uh, the reason of this uh, i want to there are several reasons one is that that's why it's so important for us to work through the pregnancy the pregnancy is a preparation that culminates in that moment because this is their life and so um, everybody looks uh, parents and us at the moment of the birth as the moment of celebration the, there is a party, the birthday party, really. Uh, and it's very well prepared just for that reason. Um, when I go to conferences, I show pictures taken at the moment of the birth of the baby. And if I don't say these are babies treated with comfort care, nobody would ever think about that because everybody's joyous, everybody's smiling. Is the moment of life. And when there is life, there is joy. In different situations with different families, different races, conditions, social, cultural environment, whatever, um, is, is really a beautiful moment. And it, it sounds funny saying that, uh, but that's what it is. Everyone lives that, those so special moments in a very different way, but it is my experience that uh, most of them uh, feel at the same time a very bitter moment uh, and a very sweet moment. Like there's a great a pain and at the same time a huge joy to know the baby and to embrace him or her. Uh, so it is all together and as time passes uh, it remains uh, overall like the 
gratefulness for, for having had that baby. The most recent story that, that I had, it was a baby with anencephaly and the diagnosis was done uh, very early in the pregnancy and it was not done here in our hospital. And when I got to meet that mother, I was very impressed because she, she would tell me that um, when she told uh, her obstetrician that she would continue with the pregnancy, that she wanted to, to be with her baby, uh, she was told that uh, the that pregnancy won't be followed up in the hospital and she had to go to primary care. And, and then finally she, she arrived here and she was so happy to, to be followed uh, and in a sense that everybody would know that her baby was important and how special was this pregnancy for her. And then uh, I was not here in the hospital when the baby was born. I arrived when the baby was, uh, was almost dying and again the family was uh, so peaceful, grateful for, for this baby. And it is a kind of thing that uh, you wouldn't never imagine, that having a baby that dies uh, uh, is like it's kind of shock initially, so, so difficult. But it's also a moment in which uh, many people kind of discover a different way of being parents and also many of them have told me that they have started to love their other kids in a different way, that they have discovered uh, what the life of the other kids is about in a more uh, profound sense. I think that if other parents who find themselves in situations like Sarah and I found ourselves were given the opportunity to explore these ideas and they were presented with information regarding comfort care, for their babies. I think that we would see a lot more of these children being born. I think um, the, the one of the things that we both agree on is that it was a much more natural process for us to meet Hannah, to see her, mm. and you know, the ultimate reality for us was that Hannah wasn't going to live, but by, given, by being given this information, we had every opportunity to experience everything and anything um, with Hannah, and, her, and even, even though her life was short we would never take it back never we would never take it back you know she her we loved her so much and we still do and that day was like i said it was so sad but it was also so joyful and they're so yeah. full of love our families say the same thing so i think having a comfort care program being more out there for people to know about i think that's so important absolutely like everyone really that we came into contact with was just i i tell them now like i know that that day was sad but it was so full of love that, and I have them to thank for that. Mm -hmm. Because they, I know that every person that touched Hannah loved her. Yep. And that just, when you know you only have one day with your child, that just means the world. That everyone that holds her, loved her. No family who went through the comfort care of the baby in our program uh, ever regret the decision. On the contrary, I'm always so impressed, struck, by the fact that the parents thank us so much. And every time I'm thinking, you know why they thank us? We are neonatologists. We're supposed to save baby's life. And in this case, uh, yes, we provide comfort care, we provide comfort and support, but we didn't save life. Regardless, these parents are so grateful. I, I even ask the family, but why, why you give, you thank me? And, and this mother told me, you know, you gave us the possibility to be mother and father. That's not a small thing.